Today is 31st March, Easter according to the Western calendar. Let me take this opportunity to wish all of you who are celebrating Easter today a very happy and blessed Easter. Uh, I should say that I myself, as an Orthodox Christian, uh, celebrate Easter later this year, in May in fact, the gap between uh, the Western Easter and the Orthodox Easter is at its greatest this year, but nonetheless it remains the case that all of you who are celebrating Easter today, I wish you a most happy Easter. Now Easter Day in the West of course um, coincides or continues, we have the continuing situation in Ukraine, the conflict there, the ongoing war, and I'm going to revert to that shortly in this program. But before I do, I'm going to say a few more things about the Crocus City Hall attack. Now, briefly, over the last couple of hours, we've been getting scattered reports coming out of Russia of various people being arrested on t suspicion of terrorism in various places, of a tightening of security in St. Petersburg and Moscow and in even in places like Dagestan. Um, there's, there was reports that some people who were suspected of involvement in terrorist activity were smoked out of an apartment somewhere. There's an awful lot of that going on. And some of it might be the product of panic and of the authorities perhaps overreacting to information, or perhaps, as I've said previously, lots of people, maybe, by the way, from the Tajik community, coming forward and saying that so-and-so has been behaving rather strangely, uh, perhaps you should need to check him out. It might be things like that happening. But we must also take into account the possibility that the various people who participated in the attack on Crocus City Hall and who are now in detention are providing information and that that explains, at least in part, why the dragnet might be widening. So that's the first thing to say. Second thing to say is that there have been reports which I believe orig originate with Margarita Simonian, um, who is a prominent Russian journalist who also heads RT. But anyway, she apparently, or perhaps others, I'm not entirely sure who, are saying that their information has come to light, that the Crocus City Hall attackers, having been paid already around $5,000 each before the attack, were receiving instructions um, via telegram from, in the form of voice messages, and that one of those instructions told them that after the attack, they should escape towards Ukraine, that arrangements would be made to enable them to cross the border, and it was expected that they were expecting that they would then be able, they would be taken to Kiev, they would be received there, they would be rewarded, they would be treated in effect like heroes. Now, that report it does have something of the quality of information that is probably coming from the Russian authorities, though it's difficult to say that for sure. But I think it's important to stress at this point that though it is very suggestive, like the reports that um, the um, gunmen, that the funding for this operation was paid for through cryptocurrencies that originated in U cryptocurrencies originating in Ukraine. All of that is very suggestive and it might point to a Ukrainian connection, or at least a Ukrainian government connection. But it's not yet clear cut evidence of that. For example, it could be that whoever was sending the voice messages to these gunmen, assuming that this information we're now getting is correct, 
who told them to escape to the Ukrainian border and told them that they would eventually be received and rewarded in Kiev, he might have been lying to the men. He might have done this simply in order to encourage them to carry out their operation at Crocus City Hall. It's clear that these were not committed and highly motivated um, jihadi fighters. They were not willing or looking to embrace martyrdom. So it's not inconceivable that they were given this story, they were spun this story to lure them into launching the attack on Crocus City Hall. And apparently they were still getting voice messages from this person during the attack itself. And apparently the instruction to escape to Kiev, again, assuming this report is true, um, came during the attack it, itself, the, the instruction to escape towards Ukraine and eventually to go to Kiev came in that way. And um, it might be that that, as I said, was also a trick to try to get them away from the location as quickly as possible. So I, I don't want to, I want to make it clear, I'm not saying that this was a trick, <laughs> that this voice message was simply a lure. I'm simply saying that this is all interesting evidence, but it is not yet conclusive evidence, even though perhaps it does lend some further support, if it is correct, to the theory that there is a Ukrainian connection behind all of this, behind this attack. Let's, as I said, wait and see. We're probably going to get more information still over the course of the next few days and weeks. A picture is perhaps starting to build, but as I said, the evidence so far is interesting, but it is not conclusive, and it is capable of alternative explanations. I'm not saying those alternative explanations, like the one I've given, are necessarily true. Now, there's one further thing I wanted to say, and this comes back to the American warning. The American warning, which we're told the US gave to the Russians, which the Russians negligently disregarded, and which resulted in the Russians having their shield down at the time when the attack took place, this being entirely the fault of the Russians because they didn't heed the warning that the Americans gave them. This is the narrative that the entire Western media, all Western officials, are repeating unanimously. It has been conveyed to Seymour Hirsch, the well-known journalist, by his sources within the American intelligence community. It is being unanimously and invariably provided. And I've already expressed my own doubts about this. It doesn't seem to me to be fully consistent with the report from the New York Times that the United States withheld some information, we don't not tell how much information from the Russians um, when they provided their warning. And of course, it doesn't address the point that the American warning, at least the public warning, only covered a period of 48 hours. Now, I've harped on about this point, about the fact that the American warning given on the 7th of March only covered a period of 48 hours. But I'm not familiar with the way um, warnings are given. This isn't way outside my world. And, you know, I have, I won't deny, it, at times wondered whether perhaps I wasn't placing undue emphasis on this issue. Well, I've now come to the clear conclusion that I have not, and that my doubts on this question about the American warning are fully valid. And the reason I say that is because there's been a number of um, very interesting articles 
written by Larry Johnson, former CIA officer, on his invaluable blog, Sonar 21, um, in which he addresses this very issue. And the reason I regard this as definitive is because Larry Johnson was, for long, many, many years, one of the key, if not the key, anti-terror expert operating within the CIA. He knows all the procedures. He knows exactly what should be done. This was his job. And I think anything that he says on this particular issue needs to be accepted as definitive, or if you like, as authoritative. It carries, as I said, the weight of um, the weight of somebody who knows exactly what the situation is. And, well, he's addressed this 48, the fact that this morning was for only 48 hours in several articles. Um, but I'm going to just home in on one paragraph that he's written in one of those articles, which, to my mind, basically says it all. And it says this, the CIA is working overtime to push the lie, he calls it a lie, and remember he's a former CIA officer, that they warned the Russians about the 22nd March terrorist attack, and the Russians ignored that warning. Simply not true. The US government warning issued on March 7th only specified 48 hours. I have no idea when the clock started, but let's assume it was Friday the 7th, and ended on Sunday the 9th. Since the predicted action did not take place, there are at least two possible explanations. One, the intel was bogus, or two, the stepped-up Russian security at the Crocus City Hall on March 8th thwarted the attack. Unless the intel stipulated that if the attack did not occur in that 48-hour window, it was moot, then it was incumbent on the US State Department and the embassy to reissue a warning to American citizens that the threat did still existed. They did not do so. That's the problem. If the US intel still thought this was a real threat, then why did the US government go silent? Now, I, I, to me, this is obvious. As I said, I've been wondering whether there has been something that I've been missing. Well, Larry Johnson says otherwise. And as I said, he's the man who knows. This was, this was his job. This was his tradecraft. He also says that if a continued threat existed after that 48-hour warning expired, then it was incumbent upon the United States to release a further warning and, there, and they certainly didn't do so publicly, and there is no reason to think that they did so privately to the Russians either. So I'm going to make one further last point about this. The American media are saying that the warning that the United States gave to the Russians was in writing. Um, fair enough. I think both governments should publish this warning. I think there should be an agreement by both governments, I presume. It requires the consent of both governments that this warning is published. I think it is necessary that it be published. First of all, it will be a material fact in the criminal case that is brought against these terrorists, which there will be such a criminal case, no doubt, at some point in the next few weeks or months, but as I said, it is essential that this warning be published, and I think that this warning ought to be able to clarify various issues. Now, it may be that both governments don't want every single part of this warning to be published. There might be concerns about tipping off ISIS or ISIS-K or whoever about the fact that the Americans have sources of information um, within their organization. Um, no doubt the Russians, who have seen the warning and of course know all the facts and in details of this warning, 
they would presumably agree to protect any American sources that um, the warnings might expose so they could be edited in that way. So I think an, an agreement can be reached now between the two governments to have this warning published and that might clarify various issues. If the warning is not published, then I wonder where the objection to publishing it is coming from. Anyway, that's what I'm going to say about Crocus City Hall at the moment. As I said, it's an ongoing investigation. We're getting more and more facts. They may point to a Ukrainian connection. The evidence is not conclusive, but the evidence that the public warning that the Americans gave on the 7th of March was at the very least inadequate. I think Larry Johnson has now put that beyond doubt. Anyway, let's move on and let's turn to the situation in Ukraine. Last night, we had another massive missile strike across Ukraine with the Russians targeting all kinds of facilities right across Ukraine. I'm not sure uh, what facilities they targeted. We haven't yet had a full update from the Russian Defense Ministry. We no doubt will before long. But let me reiterate once more that this March we are seeing a Russian missile offensive, missile and drone offensive, carried out at night on a scale that there has never been at any point previously during the period of the special military operation. The Russians obviously have huge numbers of missiles they can launch at Ukraine, and these include various types of missiles, Kinjals, Zircons, as we're about to see, um, uh, KH-101s, the subsonic missiles launched from the Tupol F-95 bombers, um, Calibre missiles launched from Russian naval ships in the Black Sea, other missiles, no doubt, as well. Anyway, I will discuss this latest missile strike when the Russian Ministry of Defense provides further details. But in the meantime, just to say once more that this is, I think it's the sixth in the series of these strikes that we've had these this month, and the cumulative effect is becoming devastating. Now, the Russian Ministry of Defense has actually provided us with its weekly summary, and it discusses the strikes that have happened over the course of the period from 23rd to 30th March 2024. And it tells us this, in the period from 23rd to 30th March, the armed forces of the Russian Federation delivered one mass strike and 57 group strikes by ground, sea, and air-based high-precision long-range weaponry, weaponry, including Zircon hypersonic missiles and Kinjal ballistic missiles, as well as unmanned aerial vehicles at Ukrainian military objects and supporting infrastructure. As a result of the strikes, Ukrainian defense industry enterprises decision-making centers of the armed forces of Ukraine and Ukrainian security services, uncrewed surface vehicle production facilities, arsenals, pole depots, air defense and power objects, as well as temporary deployment areas of special operations units and foreign mercenaries were wiped out. The goal of the strikes has been achieved. All the assigned targets have been engaged. Now, the one interesting fact for me coming out of that summary is that we now have the confirmation of the use of the Zircon hypersonic cruise missiles. So these are now obviously in series production. The, they are operating, presumably they're being launched from ships of Russia's Black Sea Fleet the rumors are that they're submarines and that they are being used, they're being operated, they're being 
um, they've been used in attacks on targets in Ukraine. And on that topic, by the way, a uh, former official of Ukraine's air defense has apparently given an interview. I believe it is on Ukrainian television, but I haven't seen it. Anyway, he's certainly given an interview in which he has ridiculed claims that Ukraine has been able to shoot down Zircon hypersonic missiles. He says this is absolutely inconceivable. These missiles fly at an average speed of Mach 9, nine times the speed of sound. Sometimes perhaps they go even faster. I gather that because they are, they um, use some kind of scramjet, they um, have these astonishing speeds right up to the moment when they hit the target. Though if people want to contradict me on that, then they're more than free. And the point is that um, there is no um, air defense system, certainly in the Western world, that is capable of intercepting these missiles. Now, I've already discussed at length what these attacks, these missile strikes are doing. It's clear that the Russians are now systematically targeting Ukraine's energy system. It remains my belief that the objective at the moment is to cut off eastern Ukraine from power supplies from western Ukraine. It looks like the Russians are also now starting to attack Ukraine's gas industry, which is, by the way, a major part of what is left of Ukraine's economy. And of course, they're also methodically destroying the air defense system, though I suspect that in terms of attacks on the air defense system, certainly the Zircons perhaps are used to destroy static air defense missile launchers like the Patriot missile launchers supposedly destroyed at the Zhulaini base um, near um, Kiev. The Russian Defense Ministry, by the way, does not confirm the destruction of those two Patriot missile launchers, just saying. But anyway, um, no doubt that Zircons can be used to destroy um, air defense missiles, but I suspect that the major weapon systems that the Russians are using when they hunt air defense missiles are the Kinjals, which are of course also hypersonic, and the KH-31 um, anti-radar missiles which with which um, Russian aircraft are also equipped. Other than that, as I said, it's the energy system, and as the Russian Defense Ministry says, also various production facilities, bunkers, all kinds of things across Ukraine. This is a devastating air offensive. Ukraine has no real counter to it. There's a rather sad article in the Daily Telegraph saying that the Ukrainians are now wheeling out um, um, automatic cannon, um, ZSU-23 automatic cannon that they're putting on trucks to try to hunt the Geranium-2 drones. And there's a report, perhaps a rather more useful report, that they've received extra ammunition for their Gepard um, anti-aircraft tanks from Germany. So they have some defense against the Geranium-2 drones. But the Daily Telegraph admits that Ukraine is now so desperately short of missiles that it's had to stop using missiles to shoot down drones. It's absurd that it ever did, by the way. And one gets the sense that overall, the situation with Ukrainian air defense must be becoming increasingly desperate. By the way, um, it's far from straightforward, I would have thought, to simply shoot down geranium-2 drones from a heavy, from a calib from a cannon or a machine gun uh, located at the back of a vehicle. Uh, geranium-2 drones are, of course, moving targets. They're relatively stealthy and difficult to see. And, of course, the attacks happen at night. 
So unless you have some kind of radar attached to these vehicles, which of course I believe the Gepards to some extent do, then as I said, you're going to be firing a lot of ammunition into the night sky and probably missing. Just saying. But anyway, there we go. That is the situation overall. The Russians able to attack any part of Ukraine at will, the air defense system gradually, incrementally collapsing across Ukraine, and the Russians, as a result, able to strike wherever they wish with tremendous accuracy, as I discussed in my program yesterday, and with the Russian Air Force now becoming increasingly active on the front lines, bombing with enormously powerful bombs, which have now developed astonishing levels of accuracy, and also using other precision-guided weapons, including large numbers of Krasnopol-guided um, shells, which are fired from Russian long-range artillery. And um, if you've been following the reports closely, you will know that the Russians have re recently taken to destroying small bridges along small streams and rivers, difficult targets for long-range artillery to destroy, but the Russians apparently are now able to do it. Most probably they're using long-range guns to do this. That's what I would expect. They're able to do it, and it is interfering with Ukrainian supplies. And also, we're getting further reports about the situation on the front lines, and there's been, again, lots of reports over the course of the night, all of when all of them pointing to a very difficult situation for the Ukrainians, especially in what is now clearly the key sector, which is central Donbass, the area extending from um, uh, Marinka in the south up to Siversk in the north. This seems to be the main area of concentration of the Russian offensives at the moment. Lots of talk about offensive in Kharkiv, Rumours, always rumours about attacks on Odessa. Elon Musk has recently made comments that if Ukraine continues the war, it will eventually lose Odessa. He's probably right about that. But there are lots of rumours about these places. But at the moment, the main focal point of the Russian advance continues to be central Donbass. And, well, yesterday... I said that two important places, Pervomaisky and um, uh, Novomikhailovka, look like they're about to fall. And more information has come out over the course of the night, which appears to confirm this. In Novomikhailovka, it looks like a pretty much a done thing. Um, the Russians not only control most of the village, but have taken the remaining part of the village, which where there are still Ukrainian troops, um, in you know, present in a semicircle, and they've basically are in a position to shell and cut off the roads. I suspect if there is any continued Ukrainian resistance in Novom Mikhailovka, it is more a function of the difficulty from the Ukrainians to retreat from that village than because they particularly want to stay there. But anyway, Novo Mikhailovka, as I said, I think it's widely acknowledged that it is all but a dumb thing. Pervomaisky, we're still waiting to get more news. Pervomaisky, much bigger place, obviously, than Novo Mikhailovka. Pervomaisky, population 28,000 before the war. Nova Mikhailovka, 1400, but it is confirmed apparently that the Russians are in control of the center of Pervomaisky. It's There's still um, disagreement about whether the Ukrainians have pulled out of the western areas of Pervomaisky, the 
about 10 to 20 percent of Pervomaisky that they still control. But again, with the supply lines apparently now regularly shelled and bombed by the Russians, with the Russians to the north and south and east of this remaining area of Pervomaisky still under Ukrainian control, if it is under Ukrainian control, um, it seems clear that that place is also about to be lost. And we've also had reports that another place, Georgievka, which lies to the west of Marinka, on the way to Kurachovo, that the Russians have now captured the greater part of Georgievka. There's apparently only outlying areas on the western part of this village that are still under Ukrainian control or still contested. At least that's what the reports claim. Anyway, there are reports that Gorgevka is also probably likely to fall soon. So all of these places likely to collapse. And several people are pointing out that if Gorgevka and Novomikhailovka fall, then other places to the west, like a, 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 a village called Konstantinovka, become extremely vulnerable for further Russian attacks. And of course, the Russians are at that point in a stronger position to press forward to Karakovo and also to cut the main roads, the supply roads, to Vugladar in the south. And ultimately, battles in uh, Novomikhailovka and Georgievka, it seems to me, are about Vugladar. Um, that is the ultimate Russian objective. The Russians have, in the past, made several attempts to capture Vugladar through head-on assaults. They found it very difficult to capture Vugladar. It is um, in, on higher ground and consists of tall apartment buildings, which means that Ukrainians are able to observe the entire landscape around them from Vugladar. Um, all attempts from, by the Russians, therefore, to assault Vugladar head-on have been unsuccessful and have incurred significant losses. So the Russians have instead focused on this more methodical approach, cutting the supply lines, gradually encircling Vugladar, encircling the Ukrainian garrison there, putting it in a position where it's eventually left with one of two options, one being to retreat and the second being to remain, cut off from supplies, at which point, sooner or later, it will run out of supplies and will be obliged to surrender, having been caught in what will, in all intents and purposes, be a cauldron. So this is the game that the Russians are playing in that region. In some ways, though, the, the most dramatic news is not coming from any of these places. It has come from Berdichi, where the Russians, this is the village, I should say, just before I proceed, is the village to the northwest of Avdevka. It's been very bitterly disputed. There's been lots and lots of encounter battles um, in this area. Um, right from the beginning of the Battle of Avdevka in October, the Russians have made repeated attempts to capture a railway line uh, that um, goes to the north of Avdevka. Um, there were warnings from Ukrainian soldiers in the Western media that if the Russians were able to send tanks across the railway line, um, that would result in the troops, the Ukrainian troops in Avdevka becoming encircled and trapped in the event, as I said, the Russian operations 
west of the railway line towards the villages of Stepovoye and Verdici seemed to me to have been a pinning operation. The Russians did, in effect, encircle and capture um, Avdevka, but in a different way, one I've discussed at inordinate length in earlier programs. But the Ukrainians have still tried to make a stand at Berdichi, um, and despite the fact that the village to the immediate east of Berdichi, Stepovoye, was captured by the Russians some weeks ago, I discussed yesterday a um, analysis of this battle by Redovka, which challenged whether this was wise for the Ukrainians to do. It made the point that if the Ukrainians are now knocked out of Berdichi, um, they would have to retreat along dirt roads, um, which could be um, shelled by the Russians using mortars and anti-tank guided missiles and that the losses that the Ukrainians would expect in that event would be devastating. But anyway, the Ukrainians have decided nonetheless to make a stand at Berdichi and in the village immediately to the south of Berdichi, which is Semyonovka, there's reports, by the way, that the Russians are now well inside the second, the latter village, and that intense fighting is taking place in that village also. But the most dramatic news in Berdichi, even though there are some reports of further Russian advances and claims that the Russians now control most of Berdichi, but the most interesting news, the, the one that's, I think, attracted the most attention, is that for the first time in the history of war, the Russians used robots, robot tracked vehicles, to actually conduct military operations. Now, these are not the kind of drones that have been used, uh, robot drones, or rather mechanical drones that have been used in previous wars, all the way back in the Second World War. The Germans, for example, used small track vehicles um, controlled through wires to clear minefields. So, you know, we've had that kind of thing going on for a long, long time. These are drones which appear to work on some kind of autonomous principle that are armed with grenade launchers and which are able to conduct, carry out assaults with what looks to be some degree of autonomy. The assumption must be that they're using some kind of AI technology. I mean, that's my own guess. And photos appeared a couple of days ago in the Russian media of two of these drones in operation. Those two particular drones have been destroyed apparently by the Ukrainians using um, FPV drones, but it looks as if those two drones were only part of a larger group of around 10 drones, mechanized drones. From what I can tell from the rather indistinct photographs, these were tracked vehicles, as I said, with grenade launchers and perhaps machine guns of some kind which appear to have been used to attack the Ukrainian positions. And there's much commentary that this is now the shape of war. We're now starting to see the shape of war with infantry assaults, what used to be infantry, infantry assaults, um, supplemented, if not fully replaced, by robots. And it is pretty chilling. Um, several people have commented about the fact that this is a little like the opening scene in Terminator 2, where you see machines like this moving across the landscape. Well, we now actually have pictures of it happening for real in an actual battleground situation. And as I said, it is, it is rather unnerving 
to see it happen. Why is it happening, though? Why have the Russians decided to do this? And I'm going to suggest that one of the reasons is because using drones, robots, in this fact, in this manner, um, is a way of covering ground where the infantry, if they were to advance, might be exposed to attack by FPV drones. Now, the Russians have developed extremely sophisticated jamming techniques, and this has been acknowledged widely across the Western media. And if you follow, as I do, film of the war, you will notice one very interesting thing. When the Russians use FPV drones and other kamikaze drones, like the Lancets, they regularly use them to attack Ukrainian defensive positions. In fact, they do this on an enormous scale. They're doing this on an enormous scale, for example, at the moment in the Siversk area, where they're clearing Ukrainian defences by sending huge swarms of kamikaze drones to attack particular Ukrainian soldiers or military units or armoured vehicles or guns or trenches. This goes on all the time. So the Russians use their suicide drones in that way. They're able to use them, if you like, offensively to attack and um, destroy Ukrainian defenders. Whereas the Ukrainians, if you follow their films, what you tend to see is that their films of suicide drone attacks, which to all intents and purposes are exclusively FPV suicide drone attacks, involve attacking, advancing Russian soldiers. And this is, I suspect, a reflection of the situation on the battlefronts in the sense that the Ukrainians are not really able to use their drones to attack fortified Russian positions because the Russian jamming is too intense. So they concentrate the drones that they do have, which are numerous, to try to prevent Russian troops advancing. And, of course, when the Russian infantry advances or the Russian armoured vehicles advance, inevitably they leave behind, to some extent, the cover provided by their jamming systems. They have to move beyond the umbrella of their jamming systems. And it is at that point that they become vulnerable. And I understand that this has been a widespread complaint from Russian soldiers that their major problem when they are advancing is precisely Ukrainian FPV drones. Um, and um, this has obviously been considered carefully by the Russian military. And I suspect that robots fighting on the front lines are partly a, um, partly a response to this problem. So you send in your first assault the assault which is most likely to be subject to attack by F Ukrainian FPV drones, robots to clear the position. And then once the position has been at least, if not fully cleared, at least um, degraded, then you're able to send your infantry forward. And by that point, since there's likely to be less ground fire directed at your advancing troops, you might be able to you might be able to advance with heavier jamming equipment to provide you with some protection against FPV drones. A couple of weeks ago, um, the Russian media were circulating reports 
that the Russian um, def that the Russian military industrial complex had come up with a comprehensive response to the challenge prevent presented by FPV drones. And I suspect that these robot tanks, which have been ground tested, this is this attack in Berdichi, it is acknowledged was mainly a was principally a test of the concept. I suspect that this was part of that. This is part of that. This is part of this overall package, which clearly involves many different techniques and instruments to counter the challenge of the FPV drones. Anyway, that's a complex thing, but of course it's also very disturbing. We're getting lots of reports that in a few months' time the Russians will be unleashing vast swarms of AI-guided um, FPV and suicide drones, which will be in effect immune to the kind of jamming technologies that exist today. It's likely the West is working hard on at least matching that capability. Um, I suspect that the Russians are already looking to counter whatever uh, threat or challenge is presented by AI-guided FPV uh, and other types of suicide drones. They're probably coming up with all kinds of equipment that could be used against drones of that type. One of the, one of the things about this particular war is that it has become an, a laboratory for new technologies. We've seen an enormous advance in drone technology over the course of this war and robot technology as we now see. It's clear, at least to me, that Western drone drones, the, the big predators and reaper drones and all of those, um, it's now clear to me that that was a wrong turn. Maybe it made sense in the 80s and 90s when these kind of drones were first introduced. But drones like that do not survive on the battlefields for very long. The secret lies in small drones operating in huge numbers, now perhaps provided with AI guidance in in the case of the Russians, many of the drones apparently use thermal in images now. This has been widely acknowledged, and they operate also at night. And now we see robots starting to appear on the battlefronts. This is the changing face of war. But human involvement continues to remain critical, and... I suspect that when all is, all of this is, all of this settles, we will see that infantry, infantry which needs to be supported by artillery and armoured vehicles, including tanks, still retains its relevance on the battlefields as well. Anyway. There we go. That's um, one thing I wanted to say. Now, before I finish rounding up my discussion of the military situation on the battlefronts, there's just one point I want to make. Um, it has been the case that over the last couple of days, uh, the Ukrainians have been conducting um, an increased number of HIMARS missile strikes. Um, these have been launched from the west bank of the Dnieper River towards Russian positions on the east bank of the Dnieper River. And there's been an awful lot of discussion and commentary and speculation about why the Ukrainians have suddenly resumed launching their HIMARS missile strikes. I noticed that one, the DEMA, for example, at the military summary channel is suggesting that um, the Ukrainians have been quietly provided with ammunition for their HIMARS. 
um, under the cover of a big NATO military exercise that is currently taking place in Eastern Europe. I don't think there's any mystery, actually, about this issue. A couple of weeks ago, we learned that the United States had discovered that it still had $300 million worth of funding that it could use to supply urgent supplies to Ukraine. And amongst the weapon systems that we were told were included in this pack package were, was more ammunition for the HIMARS system. So what has happened is that the Ukrainians have indeed received more HIMARS missiles and they're busy wasting all of those missiles by launching them at Russian targets on the east bank of the Dnieper. Now that might be a little harsh because it does seem as if these HIMARS strikes have actually knocked out some significant Russian hardware guns and even an air defense system, apparently. But the fact is that at the moment, Ukraine is sh desperately short of ammunition. Um, it's not going to be receiving more HIMARS missiles, at least not in the quantities that it once did, especially given the fact that there is still disagreement in Congress about providing Ukraine with further military Fund, but further funding uh, for uh, and the administration with further funding so that he could provide we provide weapons to Ukraine. So I would have thought the more sensible thing for the Ukrainians to do would be to husband and save their high mass rockets for when they're really needed. But no, as is typical, the moment they get their hands on something, they have to use it. And that, I think, is what we're seeing happen. So they've been supplied with more HIMARS missiles. They see some attractive Russian targets. They attack those Russian targets. And when the missiles run out, they'll come again complaining to the West that they haven't been provided with enough. That's the overall story. Now... All of this pointing, as I've said already, to a very difficult, in fact, deteriorating picture for Ukraine, both in terms of the missile strikes, the Russian missile strikes, and these Russian advances on the battlefronts. And again, let me reiterate that we are in the period of the Rasputitsa, the mud season. Um, we will probably start to see the, gr the, the ground starting to harden over the course of April, but it will not be possible before May for, uh, the, well, it will not be before May before the ground hardens completely. And in the meantime, even though the Russians clearly are able to conduct offensive operations, despite the fact that it is the time of the Rasputitsa, the assumption must be that in May the tempo of events will start to quicken up again. And this is where we come back to this vexed question about whether or not there is going to be a big Russian offensive in May. Now, there have been lots of stories about this. In the West, they appear to take it for granted that an offensive, a big Russian offensive in May is coming. And there's been reports about this. There's been comments. It's, as I said, taken as axiomatic that sometime in May, the Russians will launch some great offensive against Ukraine. And I've discussed where that offensive might be. Kharkiv region, um, Donetsk, or wherever. Well, I've also pointed out, however, that the Russians themselves have not given the slightest indication that there is going to be a offensive anytime soon. In fact, the last comment that I've seen about this situation, about the um, overall military situation by a senior Russian military official was made by Sergei Rudskoy, who is the operations chief of Russia's general staff. 
and he discussed the overall military situation some weeks ago in an interview he gave to the Russian media, in which he said that despite the fall of Avdevka, the Ukrainian military still has combat capability. It is being depleted, but it still has some capability left. And that seems perhaps intended to lower expectations of any great offensive coming. Well, we've now had a commentary by Marat Khairulin, who is one of the most uh, brilliant of the many excellent war reporters on both sides in this war. But he's, I think, the best war reporter on the Russian side. And he's actually taken this whole topic head on. Now, I should say, I'm again indebted to Larry Johnson uh, for this extract from a comment by, from the, this extract of a comment of Hyrulin's. Um, you can find it on Larry Johnson's blog, Sonar 21. But anyway, I'm now going to read what Marat Hyrulin says. When will the big offensive of the Russian army begin? These are Khairulin's words. Immediately after the terrorist attack in Crocus, Zelensky suddenly began to publicly moan about the imminent general offensive of the Russian army. And almost the same strategy is now followed by all media, including the Western mainstream. They are especially concerned about the Kharkov direction. Suddenly, the entire Russian chorus sees the possibility of a quick breakthrough and the collapse of Ukraine. It's obvious that Zelensky is building these pitiful eyes specifically to get on the sponsors' nerves, like, come on, give us more of everything, otherwise a big Russian breakthrough. Nevertheless, let's try to figure out objectively whether or not we should expect a big offensive in the coming months, and if so, where might this happen? The first thing you need to start from here is the level of Ukrainian losses. Thanks to high quality statistics from The Intercept, that's the American magazine, by the way, the one that uh, Glenn Greenwood, Greenwald used to write for, <laughs> uh, we know with a high degree of accuracy that the level of enemy losses has increased almost four times since last year. In fact, Ukrainian officials have confirmed that though obviously not Zelensky himself. He still says that the total number of deaths the Ukrainians have suffered is no more than 31,000. Anyway, going back to Khairulin. The most important thing here is that this damage is constantly growing. That is, Ukraine has to strain all the time to compensate for these losses. At the same time, we know that the Ukrainians do not produce all the consumables for themselves. They are supplied by the West. And now we have increased the load on Western wallets so much that they are clearly becoming uncomfortable. And this is, in fact, what we're seeing in recent weeks. Ukraine and the West can withstand this level of load for only a limited time and then begin to crumble point by point. This happened in Avdevka, then it happened in Ivanivska. Now we see the same process of crumbling of the Berdichi, Orlovka, Toninka, Pervomaisky line. Next up is the Novomikhailovka, Konstantinovka line. Notice, by the way, that these are the places which Kairulin also thinks are the center, are the focus of the Russian effort. You can name several more potential points, but that's not what we're talking about. He's identified the two, first two, but of course there are others, that's no doubt true. But those are the main ones. Berdichi, Orlovka, Toninka, Pervomaisky, Novomikhailovka, Konstantinovka, all ultimately pointing towards Krasnogorovka, 
and Kurahovo, and ultimately Vuglada. Anyway, to proceed, it is important that Ukrainian troops along almost the entire front are subject to constant pressure, which they can withstand only to a certain point. This is already an obvious system. The second point, the loss ratio has increased even more in our favour. On the one hand, our losses are significantly less than in the first year. I know this for sure uh, from the example of my own Slavyanka. This is presumably some unit that he is particularly familiar with. On the other hand, Ukraine's losses are growing all the time. In other words, taking into account all the complexities and challenges of modern warfare, our strategists have chosen a formula that provides us with a stable advantage on the battlefield. With all the other obvious advantages, first of all, a stable state of society and a generally beneficial effect on the country's economy. And here the question arises, if the situation is developing steadily in our favour and is improving progressively, what is the point in changing it? Imagine you build a plant, come up with technologies, debug everything with great difficulty, launch it and finally began to receive a steadily growing profit. Why change anything? Why drive the horses? After all, by and large, the time factor is also on our side. By this logic, it is better not to change tactics. In our case, do not move from the smooth increase in production to leaps, i.e. territorial breakthroughs. It makes sense, for example, to attach another workshop to the factory and run it using the same technology. We already have experienced trained personnel. In other words, do more of the same. In terms of the current operation, this means opening another front makes more sense. For example, just along the Kharkov Sumi line. Apparently, the leadership of the country and the army takes this path. Let me remind you that before preparing the Avdeevka operation, our rear forces formed an entire army in three months, which occupied the large Seversky line. And the units that are now called the Central Group of Forces were gradually, I emphasize this point, transferred to the Donetsk front and ensured a breakthrough. In other words, the Russians fooled the Ukrainians. They built up a huge force in the Kupiansk area, leading the Ukrainians to think that the big attack was to come there. And then they gradually transferred that force south and the breakthrough instead came in Avdeevka. Just saying. Um, exactly the same thing is happening now. The formation of two new armies has been announced. They will either occupy some active sections of the front and the well-fired, well-coordinated units will be transferred to another, more relevant section of the front, or they will open a new front altogether. It is now obvious that the general situation is developing precisely in this vein. That's why Zelensky sits with such a pitiful face in the ruins. So basically, the Russians, as their forces grow, now have the advantage. They can move forces from one end of the front line to another. Whenever cracks appear, they can exploit them. They can maintain the pressure all across the front line, constantly depleting and degrading the Ukrainians. And if they want to increase the pressure at any one point, with the, their army growing in size constantly, the Institute for the Study of War, for example, has now acknowledged that the Russian army is growing at a rate of 30,000 men a month. Well, given this increase in power, the Russians have 
all of these options. They don't need to aim for some big knockout punch, which would be costly to themselves. They can just go on conducting the constriction strategy until something further breaks down, as it did in Avdevka, as it is now doing around Pervomaisky, as it will do before long in the Kurachovo Vugleda sector, and then subsequently, perhaps in Siversk, perhaps Pakrovsk, perhaps somewhere else. So this is what Khairulin is telling us. Don't expect one big blow. We're revving up. We're still not fully at capacity yet. The pressure, however, is working. We're putting pressure on them with our missile strikes. We're putting pressure on them with our ground operations. Let's not, let's not change what works and what is continuing to work with the Ukrainians suffering more and more losses, getting weaker all the time, and the Western powers themselves uncertain and unsure what to do. And, well, there is a comment by a Ukrainian telegram channel, uh, in this case Resident, which appears to validate this approach. Now, this has appeared on Slavyangrad, and it came out yesterday. Oh, this is from Slavyangrad that I'm getting this. This is they provided the translation. Anyway, this is what Resident says. Our sources, this is, remember, a Ukrainian channel, our sources in the general staff tell us that Sirsky is forced to hold positions with more and more reserves. There are no real clashes along the front line. The enemy just destroys our military with bombs and artillery. The intensity of airstrikes is so high that we are forced to send reserves to some parts of the front twice a day simply to hold positions. If the situation does not change, the Ukrainian army will lose the ability to hold the defence in the summer due to heavy losses and a decline in morale. In effect, this is telling us the same as Khairulin. The Russian pressure is working. The constriction strategy, by the way, when it was applied by the United States against the Confederacy during the American Civil War, very similar strategy in some ways. It was apparently referred to as the Anaconda strategy. I'm not sure whether that's correct, but that's what I've read. Anyway, the constriction strategy is achieving its intended purpose. It's keeping Russian casualties low. It is conserving force. It is enabling the Russians to build up their forces further and further and more and more. And it is gradually crushing the life out of the Ukrainians. Now, this may all be correct. You know, let me repeat again, I'm, this is an area outside my expertise, and I am not in any sort of position to argue against someone like Khairulin, who is not only a brilliant war reporter, but of course is co in contact with the units on the ground and with their commanders as well. So I think you know what he's saying is probably pretty authoritative too. But I will say again what I have said in the past. Maybe the Russians are working towards achieving a military collapse by Ukraine. And maybe the way that they are exerting the pressure will achieve that. But there has to be some kind of big move eventually. Um, maybe when the Ukrainian forces have completely broken down, the Russian army will have to move west if it is to complete the victory and achieve the political objectives 
set out by the higher leadership, President Putin. And a resident also seems to be saying that midsummer could be the point of breakdown. And you can see the implied criticism of um, Sirsky that is coming from people within the general staff, the tactics that Sirsky is using. So despite what Khairulin says, we might be closer to that point than um, Khairulin perhaps acknowledges. Now, on the point about the Russians cranking up their military production, building up their forces, um, there's been a narrative that I've noticed that's appeared in the media in the West, especially in the United States. It seems to originate from the um, US intelligence community that the Russian artillery production is now running at around 250,000 shells a month and that it has plateaued at about that level and that a further production increase beyond it isn't likely. I'm sceptical both about the figure and about the theory that further increases in production are unlikely. We've had a report, very interesting, very curious report, about a visit by Shoigu, the Russian defense minister, to another defense, to defense industry enterprises in the Altai region. This is, we're now talking about Siberia. And we have photographic studies of um, Shoigu touring a factory. It's a very interesting report because it doesn't name the factory, tell us the town where the factory is located, or tell us what equipment this factory is producing. I'm going to make a guess that one person who probably does know is Jim Kinnear. If you go to his books, he seems to know everything that there is to know, at least by anybody who isn't a part of the military, the Russian military, military industrial complex about it. Um, as I said, Kinnett seems to know all about that. But anyway, uh, the point is that um, Shoigu has visited these factories uh, and it focuses on one factory in particular. As I said, we're not given its name, but we are told that uh, it has increased its output three and a half times since 2022. We are told that new sections are being launched with additional production facilities being built. 300 new machines and equipment have been installed at various production sites. The number of employees has doubled and now exceeds 1,600. So we are talking about an enormous factory. <laughs> Salaries. Uh, have increased by 30% and are now higher than the average in the Altai region. And um, Shoigu says that um, since 2023, that's last year, ammunition components, the ammunition components factory has increased its output by three times. This was achieved through ongoing project projects to upgrade production lines with modern high-tech equipment as well as to expand production capabilities. That looks like a reference to an entirely different factory that provides components to the other factory which Shoigu has visited. And um, we're then told that this enterprise um, is also engaged in large-scale large construction of new production and storage facilities. Shoigu is urging accelerated construction of new production sites. There's a quote from him. Take the design bureau to the construction site. Check on the enterprise. You have to agree on ways to accelerate the work. We have been ex conducting expertise at three sites here for three months. Three months. 
but it's still the pressure to increase production even further is on. And there's a reference to the Design Bureau, which suggests to me that whatever it is that's being produced in these factories, it is not simply shells. Just saying. Because a Design Bureau, as um, an institution within the Russian military-industrial complex, which designs um, complete weapon systems, MiG and Suhoi, the two fighter jet design bureaus, are perhaps the most famous. So, as I said, it's all very interesting, and as I said, this intentional <laughs> um, ambiguity and vagueness as to exactly what is going on. But anyway, that's um, that's what we see, and we, we then go on to read that um, Shoigu noted that as part of the implementation of the President's decree, the enterprises have started work on technical re uh, rearming of production lines in practically all directions of armament and ammunition manufacturing. So the idea that ammunition production in Russia has peaked does not seem to have occurred to Shoigu. He appears to be discussing more, more ammunition, more equipment of various kinds, and he wants accelerated timetables, and it looks like some kind of finished product equipment is also going to be provided as well. It's, it's a very intriguing um, report, one, as I said, that is very vague, about the nature of the fact, the, 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 the identity of the factories and of what precisely is being produced there. I'm guessing that the um, CIA probably has the answer. And I suspect, as I said, the one other person I can think of who probably does is Jim Kinnear. Just saying. Anyway, there we go. Let me once again repeat, by the way, I, I believe his books are not always easy to find, though they ought to be. But if you really want to understand Russian military industrial production and um, also the nature of Russian armoured vehicles especially, the person to go to is Jim Kinnear. His books on this topic are outstanding. And, of course, uniquely... He has visited these factories. He knows the people. So he, he actually has um, that depth of knowledge and understanding. And he's an engineer himself, which most people in the West don't. Just saying. Anyway, there we go. So no sign, as I said, that Western Russian military production is slackening or is reducing. On the contrary, Putin said, I remember... Uh, in an interview that he recently gave, that military spending accounted for 4.7% of GDP in 2023. This year, it's anticipated that it will rise to 6.8%, which he seemed to think would be the peak year. That suggests to me that it is this year where we're going to see the biggest increase in weapons production, not last year. So just, just to bear that in mind, and we're only in the first few weeks still of 2024. So anyway, lots of things on the way from the Russians, and as I said, their army is getting bigger. But what is the West going to do? Well, I'm going to finish this program with some comments that have been made by the Polish Prime Minister, Donald Tusk. He is telling us that we're on the brink of world war. We're in a 1939 moment, he says. He says that um, it's not certain that we will go there, but it's looking dangerously likely. And the West is asleep. It isn't on its guard. It isn't preparing for this eventuality. I have to say, I find this rhetoric from people like Donald Tusk incredibly dangerous in itself, Putin has again gone out of his way to reiterate that as far as the Russians are concerned, this is a, 
a war being fought in Ukraine. The Russians have no reason to step beyond that, and there's no rational reason that I can see. But anyway, Donald Tusk wants to terrify people across Europe by telling us that the Russians do indeed harbour these dangerous plans. And unfortunately, he is not the only one. And in um, Asia Times, we've had another remarkable article by David Goldman. Now, I think it was David Goldman who published an extraordinary account of a conference of top Western security officials that he was invited to last year and how utterly depressed and he demoralized he was by what he heard, by how all of those security officials were furious that the war was not going as planned. Uh, this is, by the way, a conference that took place before Ukraine's 2020, summer 2023 offensive. Anyway, uh, they were all furious that things weren't going quite as planned, but they still wanted to double and redouble and give Ukraine even more, and that the project to break Russia was still the overriding focus of what they wanted to do. Anyway, the offensive, summer offensive has happened. It has ended in disaster. The Russians are now advancing all across the front lines. Their forces are getting stronger all the time. And Goldman tells us that these people who have met again are once more retreating into the world of delusion. And he says this, somewhere last weekend, a few dozen former cabinet members, these are US cabinet members, senior military officers, academics, and think tank analysts met to evaluate the world military situation. I could say that I haven't been so scared since the fall of 1983, when I was a junior contract researcher doing odd jobs for then special assistant to the president, Norman Bailey, at the National Security Council. That was the peak of the Cold War, and the too realistic Abel Archer 83 exercise, which nearly set off a nuclear war. Now the US foreign policy establishment has staked its credibility on humiliating Russia by pushing NATO's borders to within a few hundred kilometers of Moscow, whilst crushing Moscow's economy through sanctions. It has pulled every shit, shit it has with European governments, mobilizing its legion of journalists, think tankers, and stipended politicians. That's a very interesting comment, by the way, stipended well, the stipend is a kind of salary you pay, just saying, to promote the Ukrainian proxy war with the intent of degrading Russia's armed forces and ultimately forcing regime change in Russia. The message from the most distinguished participants, former cabinet members with defence and national security portfolios, is that NATO is still determined to win at any cost one rapporteur said, this is one of the speakers at this meeting, the question is whether Russia can generate strategic reserves. Its officer corps is at 50% strength and it has no depth of non-commissioned officers. By the way, this mythology about Russian non-commissioned officers is, what I want to, is one I will turn to at some point in another programme. I've had discussions with people in Russia about this and... A lot of the stories that one hears about this are not true. But anyway, moving on. This person, this is what um, Goldman, Goldman says, this former official, then went on to say, the Russians are taking massive losses of twenty five to 30,000 a month. They can't sustain the will to fight on the battlefield. The Russians are close to a breaking point. Can they sustain their national will? Not if the rigged election of Vladimir Putin this month was an indication 
their economy has real vulnerability, we need to redouble sanctions and financial interdiction of supplies getting to Russia. The Russians have a Potemkin portrayal of strength. That's a quote. That's apparently a direct quote of what this person, this, this cabinet level official, apparently said. And then Goldman goes on to say this. All the above is demonstrably false and known to be false by the rapporteur in question. The notion that Russia is taking 25 to 30,000 casualties a month is ludicrous. Artillery accounts for about 70% of casualties on both sides, and by every estimate, Russia is firing five or ten times as many shells as Ukraine. Russia has carefully avoided front, frontal assaults to preserve manpower. We see that Khairulin has told us that Russian loss levels are low, and if anything, falling. And by the way, the media zoner information appears to confirm that. Then um, Goldman talks about the um, mythology about the Russian election. It wasn't rigged. He says, instead of collapsing, Russia has become the focal point for a reorganization of global supply chains and their, and their financing and it, their economy is growing rather than shrinking by half as President Biden promised in March 2022. Ukraine is running out of soldiers and can't agree on a new conscription law. One prominent military historian expostulated, this is a participant who was at this meeting, and he seems to have pushed back. He said, one prominent military historian expostulated, expostulated, everywhere you go in Ukraine, you see young men hanging around and not in uniform. Ukraine refuses to go all in. So they must round up all their young men and send them to the battle lines. And then Goldman goes on to say, Russia produces anywhere between four and seven times more artillery shells than Ukraine, and the West as well, by the way. Ukraine's air defences are exhausted as its old Soviet-era anti-aircraft missiles have been fired, and NATO's stocks of Patriot missiles are dwindling. Russia has an inexhaustible supply of Soviet-era large bombs fitted with cheap guidance systems fired accurately at Ukrainian targets from Russian aircraft standing 60 miles off. With five times Ukraine's population, Russia is winning the war of attrition. And then he goes on to say, this is what Goldman says, that another rapporteur, in other words, another speaker at this meeting, denounced Chancellor Scholz and other European leaders for worrying too much about the nuclear threshold. He demanded that Germany supply its long-range Taurus cruise missile to Ukraine with a 1,000-kilometer range. 1,000 kilometers, not the... And a two-stage warhead suitable for destroying major infrastructure. Um, and Goldman goes on to say, remarkably, not a word was said about a possible negotiated solution to the conflict. Any negotiated outcome at this juncture would supposedly award Russia the eastern Ukrainian oblasts uh, that it has annexed and probably give Russia a buffer zone, reaching to the east bank of the Dnieper River, followed by a normalization of economic relations with Western Europe. Russia would emerge triumphant and American assets in Western Europe would be degraded. The impact on America's world standing would be devastating. As several attendees observed, Taiwan is watching carefully to see what happens to American proxies. The rules, and Goldman then goes on to say, the rules of the meeting prevent me from saying much more, but I'm free to report what I told the gathering. Sanctions against Russia have failed miserably because Russia has access to unlimited amounts of Chinese as well as Indian and other imports, both directly and through a host of intermediaries. 
Russia's economic re resilience in the face of supposedly devastating sanctions is only one reflection of a great transformation of world trade. China's exports to the global south doubled during the past three years, and, now, and China now exports more to the south than to developed markets. China's unprecedented export success in turn, in turn stems from the rapid automation of Chinese industry, which now installs more industrial robots per year than the rest of the world combined. That I fully believe. This is evident, I added, in China's newfound dominance of the world automotive market, but also has critical military implications. China claims that it has automated plants that can make 1,000 cruise missiles a day. Not impossible, given that it can manufacture 1,000 EVs a day or thousands of 5G base stations. The implication is that China can produce the equivalent of America's inventory of 4,000 cruise missiles in a week, in a week, whilst American defense contractors take years to assemble them by hand. By the way, and for the record, Russia has already uh, um, launched around double America's inventory, total inventory of cruise missiles against Ukraine over the course of this war. And of course now produces hypersonic cruise missiles on a serial basis, which the United States doesn't. And then Goldman then goes on to say, no one disputed the data I presented. No one believed that Russia is taking 25,000 casualties a month. Facts weren't the issue. The assembled dignitaries, a representative sampling of the foreign policy establishment's intellectual and executive leadership, simply can't imagine a world in which America no longer gives the orders. They're accustomed to running things, and they will gamble the world away to keep their position. Well, we can, we can ridicule these people for the, the people that Goldman talks about, for their illusions, their unwillingness to accept the reality of what is happening in Ukraine. But that reality in itself is already a tragedy, first and foremost, for Ukraine. But he says that these people are prepared to sacrifice even more Ukrainians to keep that going. We've had the military historian complaining about the fact that there are all these young men in civilian clothes in Ukraine who haven't yet been thrown into the meat grinder that is the battlefronts, that are the battlefronts at the moment. They want to apparently continue that. And Goldman says, having listened to them, having listened to the way they speak and think and talk to each other, he is afraid of nuclear war, more than he has been at any time since the Abel Archer crisis in 1983, which, by the way, I lived through. Well, what more can I say? Um, I've always said that neocons have no reverse gear. Here we see another demonstration. They demand more. They demand more of everything. They're becoming increasingly angry and increasingly aggressive because their great Ukraine plan has not worked. But never the word peace. Well, as I often say, if you play a game for all or nothing, the risk you end up with is that you will end up with nothing. Let's hope that it isn't nothing that we all of, all of us also end up with too. On that somber note, I'm finishing today's programme. 
Let me remind you again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop and buy yourself the amazing things that you will find there. Our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you. More from me again. Have a very good day.